what is my cell cluster good for? So, I currently work for the Pippin Group, whose logo you see at the bottom there. Um, it's uh, www.pythian.com. We do remote database management, and basically what that means is I get to be a DBA, um, and I get to have 100% of my job be DBA, because at many jobs I was a DBA, but if there wasn't enough DBA work, I would fill in with system administration or stuff like that. Um, we have lots of clients, good stuff. You can see all that stuff on the website. Um, if you're interested in working as a DBA, um, we have offices in Boston. We also have offices in Ottawa, um, Canada, Ontario, um, which is the headquarters. There are also offices in Hyderabad, India, Sydney, Australia, um, Dubai. There's an office in Dubai in that new fancy building there. Um, so if you uh, if you do like working at it's all remote, so um, you would have to you know come into one of the offices, but you work remotely. You don't have to do a lot of travel, which is something that I enjoy a lot. So we are hiring which is why it says HR at Pythian.com. Um, again, I guess everyone's hiring for MySQL DBAs, um, including MySQL slash Sun. That's all I'm going to say about that. So why was Cluster developed? Cluster was developed for telecom. It actually was acquired from telecom and made into a storage engine, from what I understand. Um, it's pretty good for lots of small, simple writes. Um, it's completely in memory. Um, there is a disk-based um, format, but I'm not going to talk about that because I don't have any experience with that, which is what this slide says. <laughs> I have no experience using displays, because I think everybody's like, well, but what about this? I don't know. <laughs> so why was, was it, it works great, even though they must, um, they must have, that's from, it's true. It's very good for um, high, high redundancy applications if master, master replication isn't giving you what you need or if you uh, want to go with the uh, MySQL supported solution for more than one mask because master master is not supported as far as I know from MySQL, um, although plenty of people use it. Um, so the reason that I have this up here is that whenever I'm trying to think if something is good for it or not, I just keep thinking telecom. You know, there's a very small amount of data. It's in memory. I mean, think about a phone call. You make a phone call. Let's say you get disconnected. Do you care about anything about that last phone call? No, you dial the number again. It doesn't matter the metadata about that phone call. You don't care. You just make the call again. So, you know, that's one of the things it's in memory. Um, now, obviously, with cluster, you have a lot more redundancy, so you're not necessarily going to lose that data like you would with an in memory table. It's a lot of short data. You know, it's this number. It's calling that number. Um, very short amount of data. So here's the cluster architecture. We're going to start with um, the little management node down here. It manages things. Um, there's a bunch of different kinds of nodes. Basically, all you need to know about the management node for this particular talk is that um, that's where you set up. And if you need to do a restart of the whole cluster, that's where you'll need to start it. That's where you'd set up all the other nodes. Um, there are data nodes and SQL nodes. And we'll talk about what those are in a little bit. Um, and um, the other important piece of information is that the management server only needs to be actually running when you are starting or doing a restart. All right. So, let's talk about data nodes and node groups. Basically, the high redundancy of, of the cluster storage engine comes because you have node groups, and each node group has a fragment of the data. So, in this cluster, we have two node groups. So, how much data does each node group have? Don't all shout it out at once. How much data does each half? Exactly. Thank you. Maybe. Well, yes. <laughs> Approximately half. How's that? Um, you do not get to, in the current version, the 5.0 5 version of um, cluster, MySQL, you do not get to actually choose how you partition the data. That's why I'm calling it fragments, and I think that's why MySQL calls it fragments instead of partitions. It's basically the same thing, but you don't actually get to choose the hashing algorithm that makes some data go to node group 1 and some data go to node group 2. Now, within the node groups, you've seen I've, I've gone completely haywire redundant here. Um, I have four data nodes in each node group talking to each other. Now, each of those four data nodes in those node groups have the same data. Node is where you perform the, the SQL. Very good. Each node group has. Don't all shout it out at once. How much data does each half? Exactly. Thank you. Maybe. Well, yes. <laughs> Approximately half. How's that? Um, you do not get to, in the current version, the 5.0 5 
version of um, cluster MySQL, you do not get to actually choose how you partition the data. That's why I'm calling it fragments, and I think that's why MySQL calls it fragments instead of partitions. It's basically the same thing, but you don't actually get to choose the hashing algorithm that makes some data go to node group one and some data go to node group two. Now, in the node groups, you've seen I've I've gone completely haywire redundant here. Um, I have four data nodes in each node group talking to each other. Now, each of those four data nodes in those node groups have the same data. And that's how you get the redundancy. Um, now we have an SQL node. The SQL node is where you perform the, the SQL. Very good. You get a button. You're all dorsal. I'm going to throw this. Oh, I missed. <laughs> but I did hit the paper plate, so uh, I'm good for something. Um, I throw like a sysadmin, apparently. Well, no, I need a nerf gun, right? So uh, I throw like a DBA, hopefully. Um, so let me get over here. Excellent. Um, so here's the SQL node. This is where you do the SQL, which means that if you want to go and query the data, like you want to do a select star from table or count star from table, you don't go to the data node. We're very used to the data and the SQL being very coupled. That's not the way it is in the application, and you're going to get very confused if you go to a MySQL instance, if you try to start a MySQL instance on a data node, because the first thing you're going to notice is that there's no MySQL instance. So then if you go and start one up, it's going to be, com the, the data is not there. The data is in the NDB process, the MySQL instance. So all you need to know is all the queries are going to go through SQL, the SQL node, excuse me. Um, if you have an insert, it's going to go to the SQL node, and the SQL node is going to say, okay, I'm inserting data into the thing. If you insert, say, four rows, it's going to hash and fragment it. And some of the rows are going to go here, some of the rows are going to go here, or maybe all the rows are going to go there if it's just four rows. Again, you don't know. And it's going to go to one of these nodes. Notice how it's just pointing at the circle. It goes to some of the, you know, one node, and then the data gets put on all the other nodes. Um, and you have exact copies. Yes. Well, it has the um, query optimizer and the query parser. Um, and what it has to do is it actually has to go to these um, node groups for the rows. Now, there's one parameter that, in, that I didn't look up, so I don't know the exact name of it. But it's, it has a name that's something like push the query down to the nodes themselves. And that would actually help if you're doing a lot of, if you're doing like a big, say, table join. Instead of going to each, getting each row and putting them into the SQL node and then doing the join, you can actually push it down to the data nodes to say, what you can do here, join it there. Um, because otherwise, you're going to have to go to each data node, every, you know, go to each node group every time you say, okay, I need this row, are you here? You know, which hash, I'm not saying that well. You do the hash and you figure out where it might be, but you have to go to the data node every single row you retrieve. You're not doing any processing on the, right, but you're not doing any processing necessarily on the data node, you're just retrieving the information. When you're using the, the parameter that says push it down to the data node, then you can do the processing on the data node. So that's one of the optimizations that we found we had to do because otherwise we, we were doing a you know big select from the whole table. Um, and again, these are characteristics because it's in memory and because of the architecture of it that you have to keep in mind. It's not something that we have to think about with our normal MySQL installation. Um, and these are things that this particular quirk I don't think really makes a difference when you go to disk-based cluster, but there are some that, that do make a difference. So you can have multiple SQL nodes too, and that's where you get things like Oh, max connections and stuff. Um, so this is where you really get your redundancy because you can, you know, let's say max connections is set to 100. You can have 300 connections now because you have 100 on this SQL node, 100 on this SQL node, 100 on this SQL node. So you're really doing um, multi-processing here, which is something that we know that MySQL's okay on, not so great on. Um, you know, when we have our quad and, you know, eight core systems, MySQL's eh. Not so great about that, but this is where you can get some, um, you probably get some lower powered stuff for the SQL nodes, but again, you want to have a lot of memory to be able to do joins and sorts and things like that. Um, so that's about it. That's the architecture. Um, in memory. So I said that I was going to talk about the in memory cluster. 
data and indexes are kept in memory. Now, to say that they're completely in memory, let's say we have, you know, in this thing, we have these eight machines. Let's say they all have one gig of memory that we're going to allocate towards uh, the data. So how much memory can we have total? Who thinks we can have one gig of data total? Nobody. Okay. What do what other people, what do they think? The question is how much data can you store? If each, if each of the data nodes box with the least amount of memory is the size you can have for everything. We're going to say that each box has one gig. Now you said four gig. Why did you say four gig? There's eight gig total, except the fact that the data is the same on all these four nodes. There's one gig, one gig, one gig, one gig. It's not additive. It's the same thing. Virtual memory spaces. I'm telling you we're allocating one gig. So what it actually is, is it's one gig for this node group and one gig for this node group because the gig of data on these boxes is all the same within the node group. But because you have two fragments, right, you have two gigs total, exactly. So it's not quite the resident memory of the lowest box. It's what you set it to. Um, I think you can set different sizes of memory on different boxes. That's not a good idea. Um, so yeah, data nodes and fragments. So basically the um, the formula is you take the number of, the amount of memory you have and multiply by the number of data node groups you have. It has nothing to do with the data nodes, it's the data node groups. Uh, you know, or say the number of fragments, you know, frag the number of fragments is two because it's a, that's the number of node groups. So what's a good use of, cr of cluster? A lot of writes, um, a lot of small transactions, and very few large table joins. Um, Again, telecom's a good thing, session tables, um, waiting queues are good applications that have that. Um, anyone else have any idea of what might be a good application? While I read my notes and make sure I've got everything I want to say. Yep, autom what, what kind of automation? Yes, which is telecom, exactly. So there are some characteristics of keys or indexes in a cluster. Um, one of them is that they're very fast, there's a very fast lookup for unique keys. They're done by hash. So if you want to do an exact lookup, say where, you know, ID equals 12 or where username equals Shiri, it does it really fast. It calculates, a mem it calculates a hash, it's in memory, and just goes right to the right server and gets it. Um, for keys less than 32 bytes, it's pretty good. Now, you probably don't want a var car field that it's going to have, you know, more than 32 bytes in the index anyway. But the point is you want, at least not for a small application. And that's why, again, we're going back to telecom with the narrow data, right, narrow, less than 32 bytes. You can do it more than 32 bytes, um, but there's more overhead. There's an additional eight bytes of overhead once you get past 32 bytes in a key. So you really don't want to have, you know, one of your tables that has, you know, seven different columns as your unique primary key there. Um, and what else? You know what I didn't say back here? No, I didn't say that anywhere. Um, six width columns. I'll probably say it next slide. Um, var car is just going to act like car in cluster. So you have to make sure that you're okay with that. Um, you can't just have like a var car 255 and say, well, most of the values are two, so it's going to be fine. No, you're actually going to have all of that and all that overhead. And the reason I'm talking about size is first of all, there's a hard limit per row of 8,052 bytes. Don't ask me why 8,052 is a magic number. Anyone? No. Anyone? Okay, well. It's, the, it's an AK page and they have a header. That's a pretty good, uh, that's a pretty good one. Um, and each row has its own overhead of 16 bytes. So already, you, you now you're limited to 8052 minus 16, which is 8036. So you're already, you know, you're already losing a little bit. Um, and again, I said if the key is larger, if there, you have a key that's larger than 32 bytes, then you have an additional eight bytes of overhead. Um, a hash index itself is 25 bytes. You can do the math and whatever, but when you're talking about something that might have, say, millions of records, 
which you might have if you have this kind of cluster application, you know, a couple more bytes really, really does make a difference. Um, and I have an example, um, if people really care, but basically if you have 10 million records um, and you're adding eight additional bytes per row, um, you're adding more. Oh, what do I have there? Okay, an index that, that's 30 bytes long uses 524 megabytes of space for the index plus the overhead, and an index that's 35 bytes long uses 648 megabytes. So it's another 124 megabytes just from having five more bytes in your index. There's also a hard limit on the number of metadata objects, which is like number of tables, number of columns, all that kind of stuff. I don't know if there's an easy way to calculate it, um, but it's number of tables, number of columns, number of indexes, number of views, number of triggers, number of store procedures. That limit, and that's for the entire cluster, is 20,320. Um, so cluster is not a catch-all solution, even though it has neat things like online backup, um, and it does have that data redundancy. Did I talk about range for non-unique? Oh, you can actually have range queries. Um, if you've ever used memory or heap tables, um, you've, you might know that they use um, hash indexes. Um, and MySQL cluster uses hash indexes for the unique primary keys. It also uses range um, for a non-unique key. It'll use a t-tree. I'm not going to get into data structures here, but it does use a t-tree. You can actually have it use a t-tree al algorithm for unique keys, too. You just specify two indexes on it, and one of them is using hash, and then it will use the other one as that as um, t-tree. So even more, um, you have to have a primary key. If you don't have a primary key, MySQL cluster will make one for you, and it'll be an auto increment. So uh, that's one thing where I actually, um, I would be okay with people making surrogate primary keys that don't really mean anything um, when you don't have a natural primary key, because cluster is going to make one for you anyway, so you might as well make it and benefit from it. Um, now, deletes and inserts proportional. Now, the reason I say that is because when data is deleted in the cluster storage engine, the memory is freed up for that table only. I have no idea why that limitation is there. It probably has something to do with the memory space and fixed width columns, a uh, fixed width, well, fixed width columns, fixed width rows, really, um, so that once you delete it, you can put something in, but only in that table. Um, so to free up memory for any table, you would have to do a rolling restart, which means you go back to the management node and you restart the nodes like one at a time. Well, you restart the management node, and then you restart the nodes one at a time. So you can do it online, but you still have to you still have to play with it and whatever. So that, that's something that, again, is not intuitive. And fixed length columns, are, fixed length columns have to be acceptable. Not that they are acceptable, they have to be acceptable. What do I have? Well, I have a little bit more. Um, so basically, applications that have a lot of small transactions work well. Again, if you're doing full table joins, you're going to have to get, you probably will have to get data from all of your node groups in order to do a full table join. Um, and you probably don't want that, especially, again, if you have tables with 10 million rows. Um, there's a lot of different knobs with cluster. There are, you know, you can talk about checkpointing, you can checkpoint your redo logs, you can checkpoint your undo logs, so there's a lot of different parameters you can play with. Um, I've actually found that MySQL cluster is slower than in-memory heap tables because it does need to do that writing to disk. Um, but again, in-memory heap tables don't have the redundancy of cluster. Um, backups are online and non-blocking. Um, I didn't really use that feature because uh, why would you need it when you have, you know, eight nodes and, you know, four redundant data nodes. Um, so I can't... That's true. Sometimes you just need to put your data off-site and do a backup. Right. Right. So yeah, you do, and I, I'm definitely going to advocate the use of backups. Um, this was actually for a small application, and the, uh, the company decided they didn't want to use it after testing it. So uh, we never actually put it through to production. Um, but we did put it through to a lot of heavy load testing, and I was very, I was very happy with the results. Um, and that's about it. Um, and I do know that in future versions, they will allow you to decide how you want to partition the cluster. That is one thing that's coming. 
So, any questions, comments, suggestions? Yes. Well, here's the thing. So the question is, the question is, if somebody, the, the data is all volatile, um, so if somebody took an ax to the power, it would go away. Correct. However, what would it go away from? One data node? Correct. Yeah. If you're, right. All the data is on all four nodes. So unless you have them all in the same rack in the same data center and, you know, you lose power to it, then yes, that, that would be the case, that it would lose it all. Um, however, that's, that's why it's really redundant, and that's why it's good to have. Um, what happens if you bring in another node group? You have to you have to stop, you have to shut down the whole thing and restart it. Um, Giuseppe in the chat says here, a general rule of thumb, if you have many joins or aggregate queries, the cluster is not the right solution for you. The other thing is that the data is not, is not asynchronous, like replication. The data is synchronous. So you don't necessarily want to have one data center in, you know, Boston and one data center in Japan. Uh, your cluster is not going to be very happy. So the question is, which is better engineering to add more data nodes themselves or more data nodes in a group? Well, they're different. Oh, okay, so the quest, well, so it's a different, I mean, you have to have at least two. Um, it stops, it starts to impact performance once you don't have enough to handle the number of queries you have coming into the SQL nodes. Um, I know that's not a really good answer, but um, the, question, the question really depends on how much traffic you have coming in. Um, if you have two, you know, instead of four, if you only had two nodes in the, in the node group and one went down, you'd be fine, right? If you were doing a lot of queries for that data, it might get a little slower because, it, again, it has, to, it has to access it. But it's not going to get that much slower because it's all in memory. So we're not talking about, oh, I have to go to the disk and I'm using all the CPU to go to the disk and get this thing. No, you're getting it from in memory, which, again, uses CPU. Um, so it, it, it depends on, on what you really want to be redundant. If you want to add more node groups, you probably want to do that because you want more memory and thus more data space. Whereas you're going to get more redundancy. You know, if you had if you had four machines to add to this configuration, would I say, hey, have another node group or have you know two more in each cluster? Um, I would probably say have another node group because then that would um, increase by half the the amount of data you could have. So if there was one, you know, one gig total in that node group and one gig total in this node group, then you would now have three gigs if you added another node group. Whereas now, if you did, if you just added two machines to each node group, you would just have even more redundancy. You would have six servers instead of four. Do you need six servers instead of four? Well, that depends on how heavy your, how taxing your application is and, you know, how bad your UPS is, perhaps. Um, but yeah, in that kind of situation, if you had four node groups, four data, four data nodes in each node group, and you had another four machines, I would say it's probably more prudent to, to use more to get more space. Correct. So if you have a lot more data, you're going to need to go to a lot more. Now, and I use the example of one gig of data. You know, machines now, then kind of, I don't know if it's mid-range or top range, but, you know, if you're going to buy servers now, you'll probably want to buy 16 gigs of memory. 16? Or maybe 8 gigs. You know, we're kind of, I guess we're on the break of 8 and 16 gigs. I mean, uh, there are companies that I've worked at that, you know, especially with this, say, a social networking stuff, um, you have a lot of, like, maybe forum posts and things like that, but those are usually limited to 255 characters. I mean, you know, unless you're 
there's a, there's plenty of applications that have terabytes of data, um, but a lot of applications are going to have gigs of data. You know, maybe 20 gigs, maybe 100 gigs, but maybe 20 gigs. You know, depends on on what they do. It depends on if you're you know archiving your data, things like that. If you have an ordering system, um, you know, unless you're Amazon.com, you probably don't have 500 gigs of data in your ordering system. Things like that. So. It really, I guess it really depends on how much memory you have. But again, the disk space tables are said to work well. So um, I don't know if they have the same quirks, for instance. I don't know. Like, I could see it being a real disaster if disk space tables have the same fixed width limitation that the in memory cluster has. Um, there's not necessarily a need for it with disk space tables, but this is one of those things that, that I see anyway that MySQL does. Um, often, which is they take like a really good idea, and then somebody says, "Well, we really need it to be disk based," and so they just kind of throw it on the disk. And they could really optimize it better, but they don't necessarily have time to, or whatever. So I, I honestly don't know how it works with disk space. But um, you had a comment. Then... So the question is, is each data node a separate server? Um, traditionally, yes. And by traditional, I mean one in the past year, because that's how long it's been around for. Um, each data node is an NDB instance. Um, I don't. I haven't played with separate ports on the same machine, but I think you can, because I know you can configure the ports. So I think in theory you could do that. Correct. And so the question is, in each node group, does each data node have the same data and it basically propagates through all the data nodes? Yes. And it propagates in a mesh-like network that you can't, you cannot get with something like um, dual master or more than one master replication because you can't make a mesh because in, in a regular replication, one master, uh, one slave can only have one master. One master can have many slaves and one slave can only have one master. So, for instance, this data node down here can get data from this node, this node, and this node, but that's because it's cluster. If it were replication, this data node as a slave could only get from one of the servers. So, how does the, the propagation of data work? Um, You can replicate data nodes. Yeah. That's it. The question is, how well does replicating a cluster work? Um, the answer is about as well as replicating any other server works. Because again, um, let's just talk about statement-based replication. <laughs> that wasn't to be, that wasn't meant to be a comment on replication in general. Replication in general, when talking about statement-based replication, it just takes the statements and logs it. Um, so I don't know, does anyone know is that on the SQL node itself even? I wonder if it's on, I, bet it, I, I would bet it would be on the SQL node itself, but I can't speak to that. Uh, but it's just logging the statements that were successful, putting in a binary log and shipping it out. So again, it's asynchronous because it's shipping out the logs. Um, so yeah, just, just about as well as it works on any other thing. Because again, you might say, well, it's in all the data's in memory and it might take a little longer to access that stuff. Well, yes and no, because it still has to write to the to lo the same logs and stuff that it does when it, you know, when it writes to, um, when, when you're talking about regular um, MySQL replication. Are these nodes active or passive? Um, when you say active or passive, what do you mean? So the comment, the comment is, if I'm getting this right, that, um, or the question is, are the data nodes always kind of propagating data to each other, or are they used as failover? Um, well, the data nodes, you don't actually go straight directly to them. The SQL nodes decide 
where to go. You, you give your query to the SQL node, and it just kind of does it magically for you. Um, so I don't know if they're all active. I mean, if you took one out, if one died, or you just stopped the process on it, the queries can still continue. So it's not a it's not a named failover, for instance. You know, it's not something that you would say, oh, data, you know, machine one is down. Please make sure you route all your queries to machine two. You don't have to do that. The cluster does that for you. And when you bring the cluster back up, um, when you bring the machine back up, say machine one was down and machine one is this machine over here, once you bring it up, it will actually propagate all the data it missed back into it. Does that answer the question? Okay. It gave you the information you wanted. And there is a comment in the chat, Giuseppe says, you do need to have one data node for each data node group, data node group for the cluster to continue working. Which, yeah, well, it doesn't make sense, but, well, you, it, it's, it's kind of important, because once you can partition the data, you might say, well, this was, you know, the data partitioned for last month, and we don't care about it, so if the node group does not know, it'll just break. Why did I choose four? Um, because I wanted to have um, different numbers for each one. So I wanted to have two node groups, and I wanted to have three SQL nodes, and I wanted to have four data things. That way, when we started talking about numbers, if I said two, you would know that it was two because two is the number of data nodes. And if, I, and if something was multiplied by four, you would know it was four because that's the number of, of nodes in the group. Practical applications, you probably have three nodes in each node group. In practical applications, you can have anything. You can have one, you can have two. I mean, if you have one in each node group, that's not giving a lot of redundancy. Um, but if you wanted to use some of the other features of the cluster, for instance, if you didn't care so much about redundancy that you wanted to throw a lot of connections at it, more connections than you could actually take. I mean, the application that we tested it on, we actually had to change kernel parameters to allow more TCP connections then was already there, so, um, you know, that was weird hammer with like 10,000 TCP connections. So, it, well, <laughs> we locked off the, uh, the Ethernet interface on that port. So yeah, there, there, are, there are reasons why you might want to do that, but yeah, you would want at least two data nodes in each group. Um, again, for our testing, we only used two data nodes in each group. It depends on how redundant you want it. I mean, most applications, if you had eight servers, you would probably want four node groups and two servers. It was just easier when I was drawing circles to draw two big circles with four things in them instead of four circles with two things in them. Uh, yes. But I guess the question is, does it matter how long it takes for a certain data node to get updated? Because if, uh, if this SQL node brings something here, let's say this data node is updated, as long as I'm getting the information from that data node, right? It ha in, in reality, it happens very fast, split second. But it happens very, it is synchronous and it happens very quickly. Uh, so again, that's why you don't want, you know, your machines to be in different data centers. Now, I believe that the, the way that it actually does the propagation is by, is block level. So it actually does it that way. That you said, you can correct me in a chat if I'm incorrect. Uh, so I'll put a, a question mark on that. All right, any other questions? Can you change the memory size of the node group without restarting the node group? No. You have to restart if you're changing the memory size of your data nodes. Um, now again, you probably experiment with restarting one node, changing one node and restarting it, but you probably don't really want one node to have a different memory amount than another. Right, so the idea is if you're, if you're upgrading the memory, could you actually do it by doing one at a time? Um, and I don't think so, because again, in order to, um, well, maybe, because in order to free up memory for a table, you need to do a rolling restart. So I think that might actually be possible. That would be nice if it was. If it exists. I don't want to mislead anyone. It's a, a nice enhancement, something for the sun guys to work on, sun my SQL guys and gals to work on. All right, anything else? I promise.
promise to be short. Is the SQL node making the decision for which data node it's going to talk to? Yes. So if all of the data was in one data node, let's say you were getting one row, it wouldn't have to go to both data nodes to get all the data. Correct. So you can eliminate contention by addressing one SQL server can address one data node and one SQL server can address another data node. Yeah, and even inserts, concurrent inserts, right? If you're doing inserts at the same time, you can have one SQL node talk to this data node, one SQL node talk to this data node. Now, it keeps things like the auto increment numbers in the, in, you know, in the, in the cluster, so you're not going to run into any contentions with that kind of thing. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you, that's one of the big benefits of it is that you can get more concurrent reads and writes, you know, or Rather, if you need more concurrent reads and writes, then a traditional setup is going to allow you then then do one cluster. Um, Giuseppe says the SQL node knows nothing about the data nodes. Um, doesn't it have to have the hash algorithm for which data is in the nodes? We'll wait a little bit while he types the response. But that comment suggests. talks to the cluster, and the cluster delivers the question to the nodes. When you say, okay. Yes, the cluster determines which node is available and which one it's going to go to, you know, first or whatever, you send it at the same time. That makes more sense. Well, just hope it makes more sense than I do. That, that uh, definitely makes a lot of sense to me. So yeah, the cluster delivers the question from the SQL node to the data node. Can we have a big thank you for Sun and MySQL for the wonderful food we have? Yay.